Starlink has become a regular in emergency response, disasters, even war since its rollout. And recently, Starlink has been widely used in Florida following the aftermath of Hurricane Ian. Many, if not all of us, know that Elon Musk activated Starlink in Ukraine and Iran. These areas were previously not activated and have created a whole new category for the use of Starlink. And if you've been following Ellie in space for a long time, you'll know that I covered Starlink being used to help as early as September 2020 during wildfire season in Washington state. But when we see all these headlines, who exactly are these storks assisting in crisis getting these terminals delivered to the doorsteps they need to be on. Help NGO is one of these emergency organizations helping get Starlink set up behind the scenes so that people can get online and on their way to recovery. They're an international NGO specializing in emergency response, preparedness, risk mitigation and prevention, all while leveraging cutting edge technological solutions like Starlink. And they recently spent a great deal of time in Florida setting up Starlink after Hurricane Ian. I interviewed Adam Marlat, who is currently the operations director for Help NGO. He's also one of the co-founders who helped bring this organization to fruition. I was one of the uh, original team that kind of came together um, with the idea of being able to take some of the cutting edge solutions that used to sit primarily in the private sector or government space, like satellite telecoms, and um, being uh, able to essentially implement those technologies into the humanitarian space. So we work both around um, in the technology space in terms of getting people connected to the internet, um, both in terms of first responders and affected communities, but then also what you can do with the internet. So we do a lot around artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, object recognition, and kind of edge computing. But all of that revolves around being able to actually be connected back. Now they've been around for almost 13 years now and they operate around the world. One of their core pillars of response is technology and connectivity is a critical component component of that. Um, so we essentially go in and, um, and provide technology solutions or best practices or subject matter experts to help out on the ground. They've been experimenting with Starlink for the past two years and now they're starting to use it at scale. During the recent Hurricane Ian response, Help NGO deployed 75 Starlink units and some larger dishes at fixed sites for the government, like 2.4 meter MEO terminals. And as the Florida situation stabilizes, those Starlink terminals will be pre-positioned for helping in the next emergency response. Adam says they'll potentially send them to places like Puerto Rico and Haiti as they continue to struggle with connectivity. So we've been looking at and, and working with the Starlink team um, quite a bit. Um, and uh, in, even separately from that, um, we were engaged in conversation um, with SpaceX uh, starting about three years ago, um, just about uh, right before COVID. Um, in terms of seeing uh, different ways um, and different payloads that were being launched, not just Starlink, um, on how they could help out in the humanitarian space. Um, because a critical part um, of humanitarian action is, is obviously keeping staff safe and secure. And that requires communications, but old school radios like Motorola two-way radios and other things are, are just no longer viable in, in terms of uh, the way that people need to be able to communicate now. Um, so when um, SpaceX kind of first came up on the, the scene and the Constellation started to be launched, um, you know, it was very, um, uh, obvious uh, that this would be game changing in terms of um, the different uh, advantages that Leo uh, networks have. Um, so in terms of lower latency, um, you know, greater coverage and, and higher speeds, um, it was something that, that we saw would be really interesting um, to be able to complement um, some of the other technologies in terms of MEO and GEO terminals that we deploy out. Um, so it, it's been really interesting um, as they continue to expand their network and start to go online in different countries that are particularly at risk um, for climate change um, and getting hit by these storms more and more frequently. As they start to kind of come online in those countries, it'll be really interesting to see um, how we can better assist um, populations with connectivity. I'm in Orlando, Florida, and yes, you saw the thumbnail, and we are going to chop up a high performance dish Brandon Walsh here owns Star Mount Company and he's been doing this with the normal dishes that a lot of you probably have. The reason I'm here in Florida, I'm in San Diego, is you look behind me, I got 20 brand new Starlink dishes um, that I've been cutting down for uh, a uh, relief effort uh, organization that they've been asking me to cut them down and make flat mounts 
uh, for all their relief cars. Right. Uh, and I have one behind them, I'm gonna grab one. So you can and so Brandon was here about two weeks ago now, and he did five of those, and so now they want him back to do 20 more. So some people on Twitter were saying, why are you cutting these up? Um, they will be operational, they're, they're still working. This is not just a fun experiment. Yeah, so we take a Starlink and we'll show you what, what each one looks like. But the end result is this. We cut it down to a little, about an inch, one inch, and there's the whole circuit board. But that's your Starlink right there. That's what would usually be pointing at the sky. A lot of what we do, even before emergencies occur, is we're constantly iterating um, and innovating. Um, so we do a lot of different proofs of concepts and, and put together MVPs on different products, both in terms of hardware and software. So we're always innovating with AWS, with Intelsat, with Starlink and others. And so it was really kind of a cool opportunity. So we saw some of the stuff and some of the different pages that we work um, or, or that we kind of monitor. Um, on social media um, and we saw some of the stuff that he was coming out with and we thought that it would be um, a great idea um, to have a smaller form factor for some of the things we need, both in terms of the immediate response in Florida um, to be able to mount things to vehicles or to buildings, um, but then also um, for future emergencies because we can fit so many more of them, for instance, in like one piece of checked luggage. Um, getting that smaller form factor down is ideal. So, so that way, um, with each piece of cargo that we might put on a plane or a helicopter, we can maximize the impact on the ground in terms of the connectivity we can bring in. Help NGO was also one of the first groups to come in and assist in Ukraine. They're actually only one of 55 organizations around the world that can deploy as experts on missions and deploy service packages. I was uh, part of uh, our team, uh, actually, ironically enough, right before um, the emergency um, kicked off, we had uh, other work on the other side of the world. So a lot of our team was actually um, deployed in Rio de Janeiro that had uh, essentially two once in 100 year storms hit two weeks apart and, and caused massive flooding and landslide damage. Um, so some of the other things that we do is also around um, leveraging uh, drones and aerial imagery for disaster risk reduction. But um, I got pulled back from that mission and flew back the very beginning of March um, directly into Poland um, and then uh, essentially uh, was tasked with uh, bringing some of that equipment out. So um, I set some of the initial terminals up in uh, Lviv, uh, Venezia, um, Dnipro, um, in Kiev. Um, and then uh, once uh, the fighting um, was pushed back towards the uh, Russian um, border in Kharkiv um, and a humanitarian supply depot opened up there, um, in early May, uh, I went there about two days after uh, the fighting subsided to also be able to uh, put connectivity up in that area. That must have been pretty scary. Um, you know, uh, we have a lot of trust in the information that we get from our partners. Uh, one of our strategic partners is the United Nations Department of Safety and Security. So um, we have a pretty good feeling in terms of where the line of contact is and where it's safe. Um, so from us, from a duty of care perspective, we're always making sure that we're as safe as possible. Um, but but we also want to ensure that we're delivering on kind of our mandate of being able to provide technical and logistic support. Um, so we definitely skirt a, a little bit of, of that, um, you know, in terms of uh, the safety perspective of, of operating up until the edge of, of where it's safe and possible. Um, but for us, it's really important to be able to deliver back to affected communities um, to make sure that they're, um, you know, safe and that they're able to uh, recover. So starting uh, with the emergency in Ukraine um, here, um, we've uh, deployed a, a whole bunch of different satellite uh, communications, both geoterminals um, and MEO terminals, but then also Starlink um, uh, terminals to get out. So uh, the end of February, we got in touch with the um, SpaceX team um, and we deployed a bunch of terminals out here uh, for the United Nations and also for humanitarian doctors. So Doctors Without Borders, um, the World Food Program, a lot of uh, these um, different really mission critical organizations have been kind of using the technology. I'm, I'm actually calling over a Starlink right now in Kiev. Uh, I think it's been really good, um, especially because, um, you know, prior to uh, the conflict here, they weren't operational in this in this geo, in this geographic region. Um, it's been really good to be able to, uh, to get up and get connectivity um, where we really need it. Um, Obviously, given the form factor of LEO terminals and how small they are, uh, it's really ideal to be able to come in and, and be able to use this stuff um, quickly. Um, and I think it complements a lot of the other uh, services that, that we use. Um, so it's really good to have 
multiple form factors and the fact that we can throw this on top of the car or in the back of a vehicle and set it up really quickly is ideal. When they made that order for 75 units to help in Florida, they say that order was fulfilled in just an hour's time. They happened to be in the Hawthorne area, so they were able to get those units quickly. Adam says the Starling team is eager to assist and get units out in disaster response situations. So I know that in the beginning of the rollout of Starlink, many of you were on a wait list for what probably felt like forever, but it's good to know that not only can they make orders happen so quickly, they're producing enough that they can just send out 75 units at a time to an organization like Help NGO, but also, and I'm sure this is no surprise, they do prioritize helping in those urgent matters. I would say that um, I think that the Starlink team uh, from Hawthorne uh, and around the world really care a lot about these different international emergencies. In general, I think the satellite community does because they understand um, that they have connectivity when nobody else does. Um, and so in general teams, be it Starlink or any of the other partners that we have um, here that there's an emergency, they're usually quite keen on being able to support. SpaceX started taking pre-orders October 25th for a flat panel antenna that enables land vehicles to use Starlink broadband service while in motion. They hope to make deliveries starting in December for this upgraded Starlink for RV service which currently only comes with a standard $599 Starlink dish designed for stationary use. So the new flat panel antenna will cost subscribers $2,500, but it's better suited for moving vehicles because it's wide area of view that can connect to more satellites. The company has warned customers that using any other Starlink dish on the go will void their limited warranty. So Starlink will price that flat panel antenna at $2,500, Whereas Brandon is offering his own service to modify the Starlinks. He charges under $400 if you're comfortable using your own Dremel, and it's under $600 if you want him to do the entire piece. So he started Star Mount a few months ago. Uh, it was birthed after he ratcheted a Starlink unit to his race car. Turned out it worked while in motion, and so now he's been making these low profile mounts. And that's kind of how Help NGO and Brandon with Star Mount connected. Uh, Help NGO wanted to have that low profile mount so that they could put it on their Jeeps during emergency response. And now SpaceX is obviously announcing its own option, but at a much higher cost. So with this news coming out, I wanted to ask Adam what he thinks about the new SpaceX option for the flat antenna. There's no shortage of individual items that might be fit for purpose for different uses. Um, so it'll be interesting to see in terms of what they came out, come out with and what they're able to optimize from a speed perspective, um, but then also how that integrates, right? So, um, you know, Starlink has obviously recently talked about what you discussed, which is kind of um, the, the comms on the move um, terminal dedicated um, that they have, and then also kind of their executive terminal for aircraft. That was another thing that was recently announced. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how all of these various different things align. Um, from our side of things, we like the form factor of the smaller uh, unit um, and being able to integrate different things, like obviously, like you saw, uh, the air tags and some other stuff that give us a little bit more customization. Um, there's also um, a lot of innovation that's going around the, um, on being able to do modem deletes and other things. So uh, the opportunity of uh, potentially trying to integrate all of that, the power supply and other things into one box, I think is also interesting for us or, or potentially trying to get to the level where everything is completely self-contained and then there's just a single wire coming out the back for power. Um, I think that there's a, a whole myriad of different use cases. Um, so it's not to say that we wouldn't continue um, uh, to use, you know, like the star mounts that we have now, um, but I think that there'll be different use cases for all of these different form factors that come out. And it'll be really exciting to see, um, you know, personally um, in, in terms of what Brandon uh, is able to iterate or innovate on the, uh, the next set of panels that are coming out, because I think that there's always different things that don't fit in the civilian mass market space that fit in um, the disaster response and off-road market space. So we're really excited to uh, continue to uh, essentially partner with him and see what we can customize and make work. So obviously Starlink has made a ton of progress since its initial rollout and those better than nothing beta days when you probably first met me. But I wanted to ask Adam, who is an expert in this field, where he sees Starlink in the next five years. Yeah, I think that it'll be really interesting. Um, you know, particularly um, a lot of the um, underconnected or unconnected parts of the world. Um, so we work a lot um, with the, the World Food Program and other UN partners 
in governments um, in parts of the world that have never had connectivity, even um, you know, two G voice or anything. And I think that um, you know these broad Leo constellations and low cost um, uh, connectivity terminals, um, you know, from from Starlink, from OneWeb, from from others uh, in general, um, I think are going to be a real game changer in that space and and bring down uh, the the price um, per megabyte of connectivity um, to a level uh, where it can really benefit. Um, for me, I'm most interested in seeing uh, both in terms of unconnected areas getting connected, um, so better uh, market access for farmers and rural communities around the world and in indigenous locations, um, but then also in terms of the rise of uh, IoT, so the Internet of Things, um, particularly or kind of selfishly as it plays in our space, when we look at disaster risk reduction and other things, of so being able to um, detect micro trends and locations and um, be able to alert people early, be it if it's something from an earthquake or potential landslide uh, or um, catching a drought before it happens to avoid phase five famines like what we're seeing in Haiti. I think a lot of those things will be enabled by having a broad array of connectivity. Um, and then uh, I think the other thing that will be a real game changer um, beyond those two, uh, we'll also sit in the space of um, direct uh, to end user device connectivity. So some of what we're starting to see, like with the iPhone 14 and other things of having chipsets that might have emergency connectivity back um, to avoid having to use legacy technologies like satellite phones and being able to leverage what's in our pocket to kind of stay connected. Um, so I'm really excited to see that over the next um, you know, five years or so as that market starts to mature. You know, it's great to have everybody kind of coming in and being interested in this space. I think that, um, you know, it's important to understand that all of this is kind of like a research and development, both in terms of the terminals that we're playing around with, but Starlink, you know, at the moment. And I think that, uh, you know, both them and other constellations as they continue to come online, it's important to be patient. But I think collectively, um, us buying into these different technologies and understanding it and, um, and being customers ultimately opens access to people that normally wouldn't have it in other parts of the world. So it's something to be patient about, um, particularly if you might have frustrations around connectivity or otherwise. Uh, but I think that um, for the collective good, it'll be really interesting um, once these constellations reach scale to be able to, uh, to really help other people that normally wouldn't have access to it. So, so that would be the last thing that I would say. Um, and for those that are interested in, in helping out, I think a, a lot of the uh, main ways that you could do that would be you know, to share this video, to continue to raise awareness um, and uh, if you follow us in some of our actions, um, because obviously the more that we're known, the more that we can work with different companies like SpaceX, um, who really are kind of uh, game changers in terms of the different technology companies um, that we work with. So the more that people know or share in terms of what our work is, um, the higher that profile becomes and the easier it is to work with some of these bigger companies. Um, so we're always interested in, um, in people being interested in the space and what we do. So thanks for watching this wrap up video. I know that many of you saw my video where we were uh, chopping up those Starlinks, probably wondered why we were doing that, but I wanted to reach out to the organization that actually actually contracted with Brandon to have those Starlinks operated on, so to speak, so that they could be better used in emergency situations. If you're new to the channel, please make sure to subscribe to Ellie in Space, like this video, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you so much for all of the support.